I am so happy to be talking to you and um, I'm hoping to get to know, well, I, I pretty much know you, but get to show the world who you are um, that follows Fox fan. Because it, I think you're a very important artist and I think you've done incredible work. And I am very, very pleased to, to have you with us this evening. Muchas gracias, Liliana. For me, I am very, very honored to have been invited for you, by you and by Vox Femme, to be here in this festival and be part of such a good work about art and about women artists who are, you know, on the nowadays landscape. And uh, well, you know, I know we have met uh, from a long time ago and that we know each other's art. And I also, I also like very much your art, and I think that's one of the best things that you can do by this, influence each other, you know, like, oh, yeah. to, this meet, to this meeting. Absolutely. So I just want to, I'm, I'm always interested in how people ended up being artists, you know, like, uh, kind of like, uh, compared with my experience, like, I started drawing when I was seven or eight years old, and uh, I just never stopped since then. So. I have a question for you. Um, at, at what age did you start creating art and you felt that, that uh, you started your evolution as an artist? When was the beginning? Just tell me if you can remember the earliest memories you have of you creating and why and what were you creating? Well, uh, the, the most, uh, you know, long time ago memory I have from doing, you know, on that time, Googles, you know, on walls, and just I just felt attracted to draw and to express myself through those lines. I did not have any um, drawing classes until uh, I was old, uh, because uh, where I grew up, it was province, and the art lessons, the art workshops, children were taken to were rather like piano or, you know, dance, ballet, and all that. And now it's uh, very much, you know, like very common that children, that it's wonderful, they can take art lessons since they are very young. And so I remember myself with a pencil, you know, all over every sheet of paper and every, all of my notebooks when I was on grammar school, high school, they were all with drawings and I was like very much uh, autodidacta, we say in Spanish, like self-taught artist. I just developed uh, the taste, the taste of line and I kept uh, doing it for myself. And uh, it was until I was like uh, 27 years old that I took first drawing lessons, but I already had like some pieces made. Uh, I insist like with very, very, basic, you know, uh, things with no, with no academic. And um, that's how I remember enjoying myself, drawing and, you know, all this, I didn't have like, like uh, brushes or paintings, but I had like uh, color pens and also, you know, uh, plumones, I don't know how to say that in English. Uh, markers. Markers, markers. Yeah. And, uh, in school, I was like, all of my friends would ask me for drawings. You know, I was the girl who drew in the classroom always. Oh, that's that's great. I mean, I had the same experience. I used to trade my drawings. We used to have to take uh, home classes, home something classes. And what is that called? The home, home, <laughs> something, something like that. And so, anyway, uh, educación the Logar, I think it was. And so we were supposed to sew and I hated to sew. So I will trade my drawings for, for, for the sewing and my friends will do it and I will give them drawings. So I love that you had the same experience that you were well known for being an artist as a little girl. I think it's fantastic. Um, and, and do you remember kind of what did you draw? Like, like what were, were the themes of your, of your, of what you were drawing? Well, there were like, it was, it was, you know, like since I, when I was a little girl, I would draw the 
the common things children draw, like houses and trees and animals and all that that I liked. Yes. Yeah. And on high school, I was very repetitive on human figure, mainly women. And that's also very natural because, you know, it's a stage where you reaffirm yourself as a woman and you start like, you know, recognizing yourself in the other women, you know, you start, you go out from your house when you're a teenage. Yes. When you're younger, you are mama, no? And now on teenage, you are like reassuring yourself. So that was mainly what it was. And I do remember that Professors used to not, yeah, once I was like punished because I was drawing during class and I would explain the professor that I could, you know, draw and I could pay attention to what she was saying. It was a woman, but uh, I wouldn't care. I would still doing it because it was like very natural. You know, I have, I had the pen, I had the pencil and I would just like start drawing even sometimes without thinking you know, that I was drawing, but I could be in the same place at the same time. It's just the rejection that general society has for the different one. And on that moment, I was the different one because I was drawing instead of uh, just being paying attention, you know? Right, exactly. So, mm -hmm. More or less, that were, those were the things, more or less. Yeah, no, I understand. Do you think that there was... Um... The, the fact that you, when you were a young girl and they took you to piano lessons or, or, or ballet dancing, do you think that the fact that you were a girl had anything to do with the fact that they tried to steer you that way and instead of obviously you were drawing and they didn't even pay attention to it? I mean, we're not talking bad about your parents. I know they were great people, but I'm just saying they just, in, they didn't know and they actually, they really didn't support your what you were doing like well yes yes and no the thing is I was a generation it was not only my parents but it was all parents from that time because it was like what it was to be believed you know the good thing that children would do you know but it was not like supporting the thing that I was doing it was like the general of you oh, do yeah, what they what all the children you know but of course they always rejected me being an artist, not on that moment, but when I was serious about it, when I was serious about it, then they did rejected it. But <clears throat> on that time, uh, you know, uh, I even didn't ask for drawing lessons, you know, even if I was with the pencil or with the pen all the time, you know, it yes, was not, it enough. was not, not, uh, how do you say, not common. It, you didn't do that, you know, you didn't, yeah. there, were, there were no professors of, you know, drawing and painting for children on my time. Yeah. But, uh, but of course there was a rejection, but it was later when I decided I wanted to be an artist. Yes, that, yes, of course, my parents, my parents rejected it, <clears throat> telling me that it was very hard to, to live out of art. And in a way, of course, they were right because it's society that doesn't uh, recognize uh, the artist. When I was like uh, <clears throat> in the uh, ending ending sociology career, I found out that I could uh, have a, a carrera simultanea, simultaneous career, or BA as you call it in the states. Mm -hmm. So there were, you know, like you had to have uh, an average, a good average, and a number of credits, and it's called uh, carrera simultanea, simultaneous BA. So I was able of <clears throat> studying sociology, Facultad de Ciencias Políticas y Sociales in UNAM, and then I started attending the art school. So the first semester was just beautiful. I was like so happy to be there. You were in heaven. Monday? You were in heaven. I was That's in heaven. Awesome. I was in heaven. So I started to take the career, you know, art history and drawing and geometric principles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I had an age already. I just, uh, you know, almost ending sociology. So I was, rather than studying, I was, I wanted to, on doing, doing art. So I was visiting, the first year you don't get to have, you know, you don't choose your workshop. It's like they, they choose the workshops you are 
So I was not just like touring around the Escuela Nacional de Artes Plásticas, uh -huh. uh, which is located in Xochimilco, which also was a very good, uh, wonderful influence on, on art making. And uh, what is Xochimilco? I was Sorry. Xochimilco. Well, Xochimilco is one of the most traditional neighborhoods in, in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And it already, it, it still has these water shadows. And there's no cars. There's houses and water channels. Yes. And the, the houses, they are situated in like in a hill, human made hill. This was made by the Aztecas. So that was the way they lived. They, they did agriculture on this artificial uh, human-made islotes that are called chinampas. Oh, wow. So there they lived and they grew. They grew corn, they grew tomatoes, they grew chiles, they grew onions. And uh, Xochimilco was a piece of water, un cuerpo de agua, we say in Spanish, uh -huh. that uh, it was as important as, as all the others that were surrounding the Nochtitlan. The Nochtitlan was, was in the lake, yes? And the way they get to the solid, uh, firm earth is like uh, with these water channels combined with these artificial islotes, not islands, because islands are very big, but islotes. Yes. So it's very traditional. It has the market is just wonderful when uh, the other muertos approaches is the most traditional one. All people from Mexico City go to the Mercado de Xochimilco. Uh, beginning the October the 28th is open. It starts there. Now they have the flowers, the cempasuchi, la garra de leon. They have everything. They have everything. So that you can start like purchasing and you start like doing your ofrenda and all that. You know? So it's very, very traditional. I started, I just started, I just uh, went inside the workshop, the stamp workshop, because uh, fine arts is like, well, traditional fine arts is painting, that it's watercolor, oil, chalk, many things. And then you have sculpture that can be bone and metal and wood and et cetera. And then you have stamp that it's seal screen or is woodblock or, you know, uh, metal and many others, no? So it was el taller de estampa. So I went inside the estampa and I just went like, oh my God, I just want this. It was just like, I just fell in love. I just fell in love. And the professor was very machista because I approached him and I went like, uh oh, uh, you know what, I'm in sociology, but I'm starting this to study here and I want to be your workshop. <laughs> he was confused, he like, no, there's no room for you. It's only for first students, no? Students that, you know, fresh students. Uh, yeah. no room. He meant young. And then I would ask him, eh? He meant young? No, fresh, like from BA, like from BA, that's, it, it, no carrera simultanea. Oh, I see. I you see. know, mm -hmm. that he wanted to give, you know, first chance to the kids who just entered. But that was very. Anyway, I told him, okay, bueno, is there another stamp workshop? And he said, no. And then I said, is there a waiting list? And he said, okay, go and copy the tools and come back tomorrow. You know? So that's how I entered the the workshop and I never regretted it. It was worthy and uh so you had first to push, year, but I you had to push yourself into it. He wouldn't let you just like that. As many women do, as many women do. Yes. And uh and, and it was known. It was known. It was known that he was uh, very much starting. We were few women in the workshop. Yes. But uh, printmakers, you know, we are very strong. We are like in a bit of painters and a bit of sculptures. So it's it's very rich. So the thing is that I was, uh, I didn't study, I didn't, um, I just wanted to do art. So I just started, you know, doing art and uh, getting into collective exhibits and ever since now. Like, uh, can you talk to us about this piece, Cecilia? 
like how you did it, it was what inspired you, what were you thinking about at the time? Well, uh, this uh, piece of work also belongs to this uh, another another set of woodblocks that talk about sexuality, uh -huh. uh, very much as uh, deconstructing the taboo of sexuality. Also, like uh, like also like uh, you know the empowerment of uh, women, women, and it has to do with uh, with the first time that was, those were one of the first pieces that I made it, as a matter of fact it's an exercise it's an exercise many of these uh, pieces are exercises and uh, they be, they became they came out good you know? so uh, everything I did on uh, woodlock uh, at the beginning which are part of these pieces is focused on that on getting the technique, uh, control the technique. And you also, you always have to control the technique in order to, to break it, to move it, or to, you know, experiment with it. <clears throat> so these were more like technique, technique works, you know, and the other ones that follow also, like this one is based also on the image of uh, Chuck Moll which was, you know, a, a sculpture where the priest would place the hearts of uh, the sacrifice. So this piece uh, deals with uh, the apple that has to do with the Christian mythology, with Chacmol that has to do with Hispanic, with empowerment of women, and also with, this, with uh, pointing out uh, the sacrifices uh, that I was taking, but it, it's turned, the, the the message is uh, is changed because it's like giving life through the sex of the woman rather than the dead hearts that were placed on Chuck Moore. So I always work with lots of uh, symbols if, and meaning, even though this one also was an exercise. And it was uh, this exercise wanted, you know, like very plain black and, and the more grace you could and a great place or a great uh, part of white. So uh, I came with the, with the image, uh, something that I wanted to talk about, a message that every, every artwork has, uh, but also answering the, the, the exercise I was asked to do. Okay. What about the autorretrato? That was a, it also was an exercise. It, the, the professor asked us to do a self-portrait, and uh, it was with this uh, with the idea of high contrast. And what I wanted, uh, what I wanted to do, I put my myself with no hair, with the idea of uh, womanhood, manhood. You know, it was like artist, no sex and how I was part of the wood that I was carving. Oh. That's uh, like the symbol of this one, you know? And, okay. uh -huh. so that was the symbol of that. What about the Bebe Madera? Well, that's a story that it's linked uh, with Texas because these hearts were sent to me by La Peña. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, where I held my first solo exhibit. And I am very thankful even nowadays for that because it was very important for me. So I kept on uh, having this uh, network rela uh, relation. So they sent the hard blocks. And uh, when I was pregnant, I had a dream of a baby. Before I was pregnant, I had a dream of a wooden baby that was breathing. So I would approach this wooden baby and it was alive. And for, my, for me, that was very premonitory because <laughs> months later I got pregnant and it was the fruit of, uh, of wood, you would say. I cannot talk more about that story, but it was like uh, my, my daughter was the, the wooden baby I found in my dream. Oh, wow. Did you, have you told her the story? 
Of course, of course. Okay. And she knows why. <laughs> okay. That's okay. I don't want to get too personal either. Um, what about the Sor Juana piece? The Sor Juana is a fragment of a bigger piece. And of course, uh, we all women uh, have a wonderful, a wonderful influence by many wonderful and big women as Sor, ha as Sor Juana was. She was a genius. She studied mathematics. She was a musician. Of course, we all know her as a poet. And this is just the homage. And she spoke Nahuatl. She was a very, uh, very intelligent. And she was like an encyclopedia. You know that when she was very young, 16 years old, she was confronted with the most uh, wise men in the colonia and nobody could defeat her. So she's a symbol that I, I, I am very much, um, how do you say, very influenced and very thankful to have her influence, no? So she has, instead of this uh, Christian um, medallion, it's the hummingbird and the hummingbird in the pre-Hispanic uh, culture is the spirit of the warriors who died in battle. So uh, it was for men, but of course I put it for her because also to deconstruct this uh, woman, she, all, she even tried to dress as a man to study. On that time, remember that uh, it, was, uh, it was just not allowed in period. The thing is that she was protected through with powerful people and also her geniality, su genialidad, uh, could not be erased, could not be denied. It was a fact, it was a fact. So uh, we all know her story, but the, on this, I put the hummingbird for what I, because of what I told you. Yes. And the hearts also are because of the sacrifices we all have to make, you know, for achieving what we want. And the bigger picture, it, it's, it uh, has also a reference to Virgen de Guadalupe, as you can see on, uh, on the outside, the whites, you know, they have a little line there. And also reminds of a Chinese, Chinese uh, influence. And also, of course, it's a projection. We all artists uh, expose ourselves in our artwork. Mm -hmm. So it's a fragment of a piece of Sor Juana. Okay. No, I love that. I love all these pieces. Yeah. We, we can that's go through. Uh, if, if that's okay with you, we can go through, through uh, all of them. I also wanted to, uh, again, I wanted to see the one with the hummingbird. It's called that one. Yeah. <laughs> if you can just talk a little bit about it. I love this, is, this is almost like the same uh, idea mm -hmm. of uh, the hummingbird that is a living spirit of the warrior side in battle. So, but as you can see, the heart, it's, you know, it's an idealistic shape of heart, but it, it's an organic heart. No? So yeah. you can see the veins on the heart, part of it, not all the heart is covered in veins. So the hummingbird, you know, is a drinking of blood. It has to be, it's, it's a reference of this uh, never ending cycle of life, you know? So the warrior dies in a battle, you know, and now is the hummingbird that still feeds, you know, on, on, on blood because Blood on human beings is equivalent of savia in the plants. And we all know, you know, how, how we are all equivalent in different shapes and different materials and structure. But uh, may, much of my work has to do with this integrity that we are all part of, of, of the same being. Okay. Right, right. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, this you is- this is a self-portrait and it has to do with sexuality, with love between women. Mm -hmm. So it's me with a lover, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just, uh, it's called like that. It's llamado 
uh, autorretrato con amiga, you know? So it's, all this is very Baroque. There is no white space here. And it's just uh, something I did for uh, expressing the beauty of love between women, you know? Oh. So we have, I, we don't have a lot. I didn't put a lot, but uh, like, this uh, this series started like with an experimental experimenting with the ink that was left on the glass after I printed my wood blocks. Uh -huh. So after I printed my wood blocks, there was an amount of ink on the glass, and I started playing with it with brushes and with turpentine. So it was. It started like an experiment, and that's how I got into monoprint, okay. like uh, experiment, and then controlling the experiment. Okay. So uh, what I started to do was this is a first impression, and then other pieces that I made later, uh, they had uh, more more impressions, more stamps, more times, you know, stamping them. So. I would do a part and then I would take it out and then I would work it like this one. This was an experiment with the ink. So I put like big amounts of ink, which are the spots one, two, three that you can say like in the first, uh, primer plano, you know? And then I would press the machine very hard so that the pressure would, um, would pull the ink or would push the ink. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then I did, you know, like dripping that you can see dripping. And this, uh, this, um, the, uh, the, f the first ones where the, where the inks, are, where the spots are, they were made previously. Yes. These like uh, waves, white waves in between the blocks, mm -hmm. quite, quite thick lines. So, so it has, this one has like uh, four, I, I, I printed it four times. That's what I mean. Oh, yes. Okay. 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 You went over it four times, right? Right. Yes. Exacto. So the, you do a grabado, you only go one time, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, you can end it manually, but it's one time. It's once. Now, if you do color wood block, no, it's many times. Colors, right? Yeah, that's something else. But on black and white wood block, yes, it's once. Okay. Go ahead. Which ones do you want to show? That one, that one, that one. Like uh like this piece also is has like different uh, kind of techniques experimenting with the ink. So I used uh, straws to make the bubbles, to make the bubbles. Of course, I had to practice many times before. And then I stamped uh, the leaves, you know, the, leaf, the plant leaves that you see uh, directly. And then I roll again to do this uh, plant rock on the, on the right of the composition. So this one has many uh, runs, as you said, and I like it very much because it was uh, from the beginning of my of my monoprints. Okay. And this is an ecological piece that is called the uh, oil fish. So what I did is that I worked with some uh, plastic things that are called cintillos in Spanish. I don't know how to say it. When you pull it and it gets really straightened. Yes, it holds. Uh -huh. So, aha, uh -huh, I don't know the name of that, but uh, those are the white things that you see. So I made the shape of fish, meaning that fish are swimming in an oil so eventually they're going to be oil fish. Oh, wow. And, and this is a uh, three piece, three piece, uh, the three piece monoprint because this is the other one because uh, this was for an exhibit that was called uh, Plastic Madness and had to do with the pollution of plastic. 
Wow. So it's a triptycho, it's three pieces. So oh, this is the good. other one. And you know how the, so this was made with this plastic directly and a spray, spray paint. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then I worked with a little like, chalk and many other things, but that's mainly. But so this one is not printed. A stamp. It's called a stamp. Yes. Oh, okay. Remember, stamp is printing, but it's different. You know, it's like one, you know, like this one is monoprint because it's one. Uh huh. Okay, got it. See, and then through experimenting, this is a skull, you know, and it, I liked it very much. I like monoprint very much because it's very expressive. Uh -huh. uh, your your brush, your movement is very gestual, very gestual. Yes. And also it's very demanding because you cannot erase, you cannot paint over. Yes. Right. So it was a wonderful challenge and I really enjoyed doing, uh, doing monoprint. And this is how I started to do like the other pieces that uh, you have in color. After this, I started uh, using color. No? Yeah, let's go one by one. And uh, this one is called uh, fish nest. So I made uh, figures of fish with branches. You can see a branch that looks like a fish on the upper side, mm -hmm. and it's a nest. So this, this uh, series is called uh, quantum nest because uh, what I want to express is that we are like humans. We have part of mineral, part of uh, vegetable, part of, uh, you know, many other uh, kinds of living and, and things that we are part of. So right. fish can be plants also. Right, right, right. Uh, this one also is the same, it's very also experimental because it was like the, the ink that I told you that I pressed it with uh, the press in uh -huh. different uh, numbers, different pressure. And then I worked with colors. I started working with water-based uh, printing uh, paints, no? And I, I used, uh, here I started working with watercolor, so the monoprints started getting more, uh, more, more complicated, more with more, more techniques in each one. Mm -hmm. This is one that I haven't finished. It's a big piece. I am finishing right now this one, and it's huge. It's a well, no, it's not really huge, but it's like, uh, say, como dos metros por. 80 centimeters, oh, and is. this is a fragment of it. Okay, okay. <laughs> this also here I'm working another also technique mixta because you can see like the direct print making and then you see this uh, water fish that is a photographic uh, transfer. I. This is not a photograph of mine, but uh, I was I was doing photography for a long time. And uh, with a stamp technique, you can make the transfer from the paper of a Xerox copy to art paper. And then I worked over it with uh, stamp and color. And this piece is called uh, plant fish. It's a very long time work that I did because it has layers and layers, as you can see. Mm -hmm. uh, but I like I liked uh, very much the result ones because uh, if you can see, there's like little fish also that yes. were made by plants. So I still have this, uh, you know, message of this series of that we that fish are plants and plants also are stones and etc. So this is an, an underwater, no? This is in underwater and it's a plant fish and it, it has watercolor and stamp and monoprint and transfer. So it's a very complicated piece and it was, many of the pieces that we have seen have been um, end prices or 
uh, being selected for for many exhibits. Uh, this one too. So uh, this is one of the of, of still the series of quantum mess that deals uh, trying to recall the people the wonder of how beautiful and precious and perfect nature is. Uh -huh. and trying to give them a little bit of a, how do you say surprise feeling of not just seeing the fish but seeing a, a, a plant fish right this also has the same the same message meaning that the main uh, circle beings are wasps babies you know but wasps the eggs, or you can see the little wasp inside the egg. Mm -hmm. And the blue ones are microscopic figures. And then the other elements are stamps of, uh, uh, of uh, plants and then colored by hand, of course, meaning uh, the name of this piece is uh, floating seed. So this means that wasps also are seeds and that these uh, microscope uh, blue figures are also eggs, like also interacting many ways and forms of life in a harmonic way. Mm -hmm. you know? oh, okay. See, so this piece also is of quantum mess, and this is like imagining, uh, you know, a plant, how it looks out of, of the earth and how the roots look under. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's not a tree that you can say it's like that, that you can see the outer part of the tree, which is the trunk and the leaves and the fruit. And you don't see the roots of the tree, which are a tree by itself because they're huge, but they're very different. And that's, uh, that's why it's called the uh, Ojadual. Okay, so this piece also it's experimental. It has many stamps and uh, also has elements of collage with some text that I took out from uh, newspapers. And it's also just, you know, like playing with the technique. And uh, of course, there's always a message, but uh, like this piece is a more a pretext, you know, to experiment and to see what comes up. What, what comes out. This is a diptycho, it's two parts. It's uh, the left and the right part of it. And it's also, it's like these plants, it made also with the same techniques, transfer, photo transfer, and uh, chalk. This one has lots of chalk. And um, it's not like, decorative but these these two pieces became out very decorative because they're like separated but they have like equivalence with each other so this i didn't mean to sometimes that happens with with what i do that i experiment and even if i control the technique it also has the surprise of uh, what happens in the time you are doing art which is uh, one of the best parts on, on doing art is the process. Yeah. This also is called uh, a coral fish, also meaning that only fish not only live in coral, they are in coral. They are part of this coral set and planet of living things, you know, a coral receive is very, very complicated. It has many beings that form part of it. So that's what I meant to say here that it's not only fish who live in coral, they are coral fish. And this is a linoleum print uh, that is called uh, uh, Quetzalcoat, and it has like a blind blind uh, impression, a blind stamp of the same uh, linoleum block. And that's because you wet a lot the paper. It has to be, of course, art paper, cotton, uh, preferably cotton paper. And then you wet it a lot, and then you 
press with high pressure the, the, linoleum, uh, the linoleum block on the paper. So the drawing of the block with no ink also comes out. So this is a mixture of the colored uh, linoleum and the, the non-colored but highly pressured stamp of the linoleum. Beautiful. Thank you. And this is like the bridge on the monoprints that we were talking and the, the colored um, monoprints and technica mixta because these are not more merely monoprints. So this one uh, has lots of uh, layers and started that this is where the color started in my monoprints. Mm. And the name of this piece is called uh, Rain, Rain Nature. So it, it tries to give you the feeling of rain wow. rather than description. Mm -hmm. And this also is a wood block that became uh, a seal screen. And uh, this also was made in in San Francisco, in Mission Cultural Center. The wood block was made in Mexico. I printed in Mexico, and then I took it with me in San, San Francisco. And on that time, well, yes, of course, there were computers, but there was not uh, such uh, familiarity and so many resources on computers. So uh, they did the transfer with a photomechanical uh, machine, it not kind of a camera. And then uh, I, I did the, the other design, like this uh, Borba wire. That means that the Virgen de Guadalupe is sleeping at the border as uh, migrants do. Uh, migrants at the border have to sleep until there's no patrol patrolling or you know dangers that they can avoid so they have to wait until it's dark in the night and things like those so this is the virgen de guadalupe uh, who is sleeping at the border well i i just thank you for showing us that i absolutely love your work and i think it's uh it's really nice to hear the explanations because it's just such a world that is inside of each one of these pieces that it's amazing to see it. Like they're like, like an invisible world that you have created, you know? And, and I absolutely love that. I also wanted to ask you, um, besides doing a wonderful work with your own work, you, you lately have done a tremendous work. You call yourself a cultural activist. And um, now you have been the director of the Museum of Art of Mazatlan and you have brought exhibits to where you <clears throat> focus on women that have been pretty much overlooked or issues that have to do with women that have also been overlooked. So I would like for you to talk to us a little bit about that. Well, no, yes, because um, I think uh, this uh, vocation of promoting or you know being a cultural activist uh, came from no, from my family, my family, uh, many of my family are politicians, were, and also of my sociology background, you know, where I enlightened myself in many issues I didn't even think of it before. So um, I've always been a professor, and ever since uh, university, I started organiz organizing uh, exhibits. Even at the beginning of, uh, of me studying seriously art, you know, in the university. Before that, I didn't study art. So um, I have been always suggesting, you know, uh, themes or festivals or the celebration of Dia de Muertos in el Teatro, that was also my idea. And it was like both of my loves and pleasures mix, which is art and cultural promotion, because I do like organizing, and that's a fact. I like it, I enjoy it, and I am creative on organizing. I like it, uh, but I also love painting, 
So being a director has given me more resources than I had before, because before I, I organized and everything, but at another level. So when I became a directora del Museo de Arte de Mazatlán, I also became Delegada Sur del Instituto Sinaloense de Cultura. And that means the south part of the state of Sinaloa. So it was a huge uh, mission, no? And we did have many um, original programs that started to deal with artists of the south of the state. And of course, I have always been a feminist, even if I don't belong to any collective group, as I have always been uh, politically oriented, even though I don't belong to any political party, I don't believe on them. So uh, when I became director of the Museo de Arte, I, have, I now have a wonderful team that I coordinate. Uh, Two of them are artists, another one is on press, the other one is on media. We are not too many, but we are 16 people working in the museum. So that gave me much more, um, how do you say, much more rango, rank of action on my, of my programs and projects. And then uh, women, women exhibits always was a, a very important issue, you know, because we all know that women in museums are on the paintings, not on the credits. You no, know? so uh, of course many women have been exhibited than before. Before the pandemic, uh, I did like a feminist. Uh, two-day festival in the museo. And many collective, many feminist collective approached and many other women who were not the collective feminist groups, but were feminist approached also. Uh, but then the pandemic came and we couldn't uh, do the follow-up, yes. But on February of this year, I uh, restarted this program, but I thought to myself, now I have only a few months to do something important for this issue. So uh, I started on February because it was not a matter of doing it only on March. So that's why Compañeras was born. It's a monthly, a monthly program. And because of the pandemic, it's a hybrid program because we have like the physical event in the museo the, on Friday, the first Friday of every month. And then we have the streaming conferences and exhibits and many other events uh, through, through Facebook Live, yes? Yeah. So I started to get, uh, to go back with uh, feminist friends that I didn't get to see because I couldn't bring them to Mazatlan physically for the money because for the money reasons. But then, for instance, I called uh, Monica Mayer and I said, well, Monica, we've been friends. We did these compañeras decades ago, decades ago in, in Austin, you were part of that. Uh -huh. We were three people of Austin and three people of Mexico City, three, uh, six women artists. And uh, I said to her, why don't you give us a conference? She said, yes. And then one thing led to the other one because then I asked, then she said, I can give you a workshop. And I said, yes, of course, when do we start? And now we are doing this huge feminist art, uh, how do you say, event, which is called uh, Los Tendederos de Sinaloa. And uh, I don't know if you've heard about Los Tendederos, but Los Tendederos were created by Monica Mayer on the, in the 70s. And uh, they consist on a workshop that, you know, women do all together to come up with questions that you will ask to women who are passing by the street. Mm -hmm. So you approach them, you make the questions, they write it down or you write them down and then you put them on a hanger. Then they don't. Like yes. And they're anonymous, so it's very important because as, as, a, as an example, I can write my answer and you know you don't know that I wrote it. Uh -huh. 
-huh. but then you read it and then you say, oh, that happened to me too. So the normalization of uh, harassment and the normalization of men uh, hitting women and you know many other awful things, uh, women who don't have the you know the knowledge or or the conscience to recognize acoso we call it in Spanish harassment would be in English so they become awesome. aware that they're not the only ones you know so it yeah. starts like a healing and a, also like a socialization of the problem and in Mazatlan we started also like saying okay you tell me your story yes we write it down beautiful but then we gave them a directory of places of help so if you need a uh, how do you say law assistance? You can go with this collective. And if you want psychological assistance, you can go to this. And if you want a refugee because your husband wants to kill you, you can go to this. And also, very important, we confirm all that information before because one of the horrible things that happens when a woman is raped is that she becomes a criminal because how you were dressed, because you were walking in the night because you shouldn't show your boobs, because et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So on that way, we try to deconstruct that. And we, the thesis that I know it is, is that if harassment isn't stopped by education uh, and it's still you know, supported by the normalization of it, uh, it starts to grow. So the little boy that you know pulls your brain when you were in grammar is going to steal you a kiss or spank you on high school until he rapes you and until he kills you. Because plus all that we have in Mexico in impunidad for the rapers, impunidad, impunity, is that the word? So that's what we are doing with the Tendederos. And on August the 13th, we are going to make the opening of uh, three simultaneous exhibits on Los Tendederos in the three major cities of Sinaloa, which is Los Mochis up north, very up north, and then Culiacán, which is you know the center of all Sinaloa, politically, economically, etc. And then Mazatlán, which is the tropical sur de Sinaloa. Museo de Arte Mazatlán uh, with Karen Cordero, that uh, she's one of the main figures in feminist, uh, feminism uh, y arte. So the goal is that we, the old ones that have all these relations, can pass them to the young ones. And, you know, so for instance, in the conference, I hardly talk. I only read like the resume and I let the young ones to to talk with the big ones, to, to get those relations for themselves. Yeah, that's, I think is, is extraordinary, the kind of work you're doing. And especially because right now the situations with the domestic violence and the suicide and the femicides have become so much more, um, mucho mas graves. I don't know why this is getting, I thought we would be going the other way but it's not, it's going the wrong way, absolutely. Uh, that's why it's so important to do this kind of uh, art and activism uh, events because that way you get more conscious about it. And also because it's unbearable, it's too much. It's too much, you have to do something about it. So that's why we are doing it, the, the three cities at the same time. And it's very interesting because it's not only independent, independent collectives. One of the best values that Monica Mayer has said is that you have three museos. Museo is, uh, you know, uh, how do you say, supporting that. That's amazing. It's culture, yes, that doesn't yeah. happen a lot. So it's very good because it's also like an example to be followed. Exactly. The union of uh, institutions and independent artists and promoters to do something about a matter that is social, not only of feminism matter. It's a social matter. And of course, we feminists, we are very active about it because we are the ones that are killing. And that's the fact, they are killing us. So that's why 
it's very important to do it. Yeah, to show our strength. No, I know I agree. This is fantastic. And that is the reason why I wanted you to be in this interview, besides showing your work, but it's just that everything you do is so important and so hopeful too. And these times are so difficult that sometimes you may just feel that it's hopeless, but it never is. And that's what these events, that's why I love what you're doing, that, that those events truly make you feel like you belong. And we're not separated as women anymore. And this is what Vox Femme is doing too. They are doing exactly the same thing, you know, elevating the women as to the rightful place that it should be, you know? So I'm really grateful that you took the time to talk to us and to have the exhibit at Vox Femme. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Really appreciate it. Igualmente, gracias a ustedes. Toda la suerte. And we will keep in touch. Thank you.